We have one final session for you that you will not want to miss. Many of the questions we've discussed today have been about the responsibilities of business leaders to their businesses, their customers, employees, and the larger community. In times of volatility, like the one we are currently facing, it's easy to lose sight of these responsibilities. What is the purpose of business in the first place? This question gets to the heart of many of the questions we are asking. Milton Friedman, who Father Sirico and John Mackey just referenced, famously argued that the social responsibility of business was to increase its profits. This view was influential for decades. In 2019, the Business Roundtable made headlines by changing their statement on the purpose of a corporation to incorporate the language of stakeholderism, which calls on businesses to look beyond shareholders and to consider other constituents, such as employees, suppliers, the community, and even broader social concerns, such as environmental or racial justice. But what is the role of business in society? Our three panel speakers will engage in a fruitful conversation on this topic, illustrating the different answers one might give to the question, what is the purpose of business? Amelia Miazad is an expert in sustainable capitalism and founded and leads the Business in Society Institute at Berkeley Law. The Institute's mission is to define and advance a legal and policy agenda that encourages companies to account for stakeholders and the environment. Amelia's recent publications explore stakeholder governance and ESG as a process for overseeing risk and a powerful tool for transforming corporate culture. She regularly presents to audiences of corporate executives in the United States, South America, and Europe. Will Anderson is a Senior Director, Policy, for the Business Roundtable. In this role, he is responsible for analyzing and advocating federal legislative and regulatory policies that promote U.S. competitiveness, economic growth, and job creation. Before joining the Roundtable, Mr. Anderson has served as a Senior Associate for Potomac Global Partners and as an advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for Legal Reform. Dr. Samuel Gregg is the Director of Research at the Acton Institute. He's written and spoken extensively on questions of political economy, economic history, ethics and finance, and natural law theory. He's the author of 13 books, including The Struggle for Western Civilization. He publishes in journals such as the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and the Journal of Markets and Morality. He also writes regularly for publications such as the Wall Street Journal, National Review, and Business Review Weekly. To moderate this discussion, we have Dr. James Audison. Dr. Audison is a professor of business ethics and faculty director of the Notre Dame Deloitte Center for Ethical Leadership at the University of Notre Dame. He's also a visiting scholar of the Fulner Institute at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, DC. He specializes in business ethics, political economy, the history of economic thought, and 18th century moral philosophy. His books include The Essential Adam Smith and Honorable Business, among many others. He has three books forthcoming, including Seven Deadly Economic Sins. Thank you very much for that introduction, Chris. It's a great pleasure to be with you and with the Acton Institute, and especially with this very distinguished uh, panel to have a discussion that we hope will be both provocative and robust, um, but also of course civil, um, about a topic that is extremely timely, um, shareholder versus stakeholder conceptions of business and more generally, what really is the purpose of business? So my name is Jim Audison. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, three distinguished scholars, uh, Professor Miazad, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Samuel Gregg. And we would like to give each of them a few moments to make some opening statements. So let's go in that order and we'll start with Professor Miazad. Professor Miazad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so we're here today to answer uh, age old question, what is the purpose of business? Well, in 2000, a well known article entitled The End of History for Corporate Law pronounced that there is no longer any serious competitor 
to the view that corporate law should principally strive to increase long-term shareholder value. Well, here we are in 2021 and corporate purpose has reemerged as what a recent scholar called the hottest topic in corporate governance. And I would agree with that. Now you might think that as a law professor, I can just crack open a book and look up the answer to that question. What is the purpose of business? But unfortunately, there are very few cases in Delaware, which is the most important jurisdiction for corporate law, of course, on corporate purpose. And none of them are actually very definitive, which happily leads to endless publication opportunities for, for law professors. Um, so let's turn to the debate. On one side of the debate, stakeholder governance theorists blame shareholder primacy for really exacerbating societal ills. And these include um, things like income inequality to climate change. These scholars are arguing that the purpose of a corporation is not to create profits at the expense of society, but rather to solve society's problems profitably. Now, on the other side of the debate, the shareholder primacy theorists have doubled down on their fidelity to profit maximization. Their arguments are worthy. They argue that it's the only viable North Star. It leads to societal benefit through wealth generation. And importantly, very importantly, it offers a tried and true way to hold directors accountable to shareholders. Now, these traditionalists, of course, concede that businesses cause grave societal externalities and they point to regulation as a remedy. So there's environmental law, there's labor law, and corporate law should really stay in its own lane. So the argument goes. My work doesn't actually fit comfortably in either of these paradigms. I take an institutionalist approach to corporate law, and I, I try to examine the corporate purpose debate not from the perspective of these theoretical frameworks, but I try to observe what's actually happening in the business and investment community. And there's, of course, a lot happening in that community today. So what challenges exactly is the business community facing? And what challenges face society today? And why are we at this juncture where we're renegotiating the relationship between business and society at this moment? So by observing corporate executives and practice, uh, a little bit like an anthropologist might observe communities, what I've discovered um, in my work is that both the sides of the stakeholder shareholder debate I believe suffer from blind spots. The business and investment community appears to be sailing swiftly towards a pro-social and pro-stakeholder oriented view of corporate purpose. Now, why is that happening? Why is there this coalescence around the idea of a pro-social or stakeholder oriented view of corporate purpose? Even the Biden administration has promised to put an end to the era of shareholder capitalism. And from Wall Street to Main Street to the Beltway, pro -social, the pro-social corporation appears to be reigning triumphant. But importantly, this isn't the first time that the business community has championed a more compassionate version of capitalism. I mean, we've had the whole corporate sustainability movement, the corporate responsibility or CSR movement, the sustainable investment movement that took place in the 80s and the 90s. As far back as the 50s, um, Howard Bauman, the, the, uh, considered the father of CSR, was making very similar arguments. Well, I argue that this rapid ascendance of the pro-social corporation has coincided with two parallel developments, and they both relate to externalities. And they relate specifically to a recalibration of these externalities. Now, shareholder activist Robert Monks astutely observed that the corporation as an, is an externalizing machine, uh, and he famously compared it to the same way that a shark is a killing machine. Um, things like fossil fuels provide a paradigmatic example of an industry that has successfully externalized its negative um, externalities from a profit maximization perspective. Uh, that's because the true cost of the environmental degradation from, uh, from gas is borne by the rest of society. Now, 
Until relatively recently, companies have mostly been incentivized to externalize uh, these uh, negative impacts um, and to take ever more risk. And corporate law is really oriented around incentivizing that risk taking. But today, there's a widespread consensus that the gig may be up uh, because of the increased impacts of climate change. Um, and this is no longer importantly deemed a progressive argument. The Pentagon has identified climate change as a national security concern. And of course, even insurance companies are building this into their underwriting process. So uh, this story also plays out on the social side of the equation. Companies are recognizing that um, human rights abuses and racial and gender discrimination is hurting the long-term sustainability of their business. But the important question is why, why are investors pushing companies to be more pro-social? Now that seems a little odd. Um, and here's where the story gets really pretty interesting. It arises out of an unexpected plot twist that has placed systemic, systematic risks, such as climate change, income inequality, in the financial sector's spotlight. And the reason for that is because there's been a concentration of capital due to the rise of index investing. Capital has become concentrated in a few small asset managers. Now, to put this phenomenon in perspective, the big three asset managers, Blake, uh, BlackRock, State Street, uh, um, and Vanguard, collectively uh, hold over 20% of the S&P 500. Um, and in addition to the large asset managers, there's been a growth in pension funds. And so this group of asset managers is commonly referred to as universal owners. And universal owners have portfolios that are so large that they're economy mirroring. And I mean, let's think about this for a moment. Because they're so diversified, they cannot diversify away from idiosync from um, systematic risks. So they can diversify idiosyncratic risk, but not systematic risks. And in this way, it brings the incentives, I argue, of the large mass asset managers in closer alignment with the risks that are facing society. And that explains statements made by Larry Fink, and that explains statements that from the business roundtable, um, you know, because those directors are really feeling the pressure from the investment community. Um, now, corporate law, as I mentioned before, points to regulation to address these systematic risks. But regulation is not able to do so uh, for a number of reasons with sufficient speed uh, or spe sufficient specificity, if at all. And so as a result, these universal owners are filling this vacuum to address these systematic risks. And stakeholders, I'm sorry, companies are responding to this pressure, how? They're responding to this pressure through stakeholder governance. By taking into account the impact of their business on stakeholders, companies are managing uh, and mitigating risks. And understanding this institutional perspective sort of makes the accountability critique fall away in many ways. The pressure for companies to be more socially minded, importantly, is coming from shareholders for very sound economic and risk oversight reasons. So at this point, I of course haven't directly answered the question, what is the purpose of business? Uh, so to answer that question, I'll, I'm going to borrow a definition from uh, Jonathan Charkham and Ann Simpson, which is the purpose of business is to meet society's needs and wants ethically and profitably. This definition captures wealth generation for shareholders, but importantly, that wealth generation is a byproduct and it accounts for the impact of business on stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Miazad. Um, we will now turn to Will Anderson, who is the Senior Director for the Policy for the uh, Business Roundtable. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Chris and Jim, and thank you to the Acton Institute for uh, the kind invitation to join today to talk about the purpose of business. 
Um, I am the Senior Director of Policy at the Business Roundtable, which is an association of CEOs of America's leading companies based in Washington, D.C. Um, Business Roundtable represents all sectors of the U.S. economy. We've got well over 200 CEO members who lead companies with uh, more than 15 million employees who provide health care and retirement benefits to tens of millions of Americans uh, and generate more than $480 billion a year in revenue for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, with that said, I, I want to note um, I'm here in my own capacity uh, and that the opinions that I share are my own and not necessarily that of uh, our association of or of our members, uh, CEOs. But it's a real privilege to be here and to be hosted by the uh, Acton Institute. Our CEOs see very much like your institution the need to speak out in defense of free enterprise and a strong private sector. Business Roundtable CEOs um, have been active in supporting pro-growth tax and trade policies and in arguing against excessive regulation. And we're, we're firmly opposed to intrusions into business decision-making that would stifle innovation or growth or that would handicap the free markets or U.S. competitiveness. And these topics will always be central to BRT's agenda. But in recent years, our CEOs have begun asking whether defending capitalism and free enterprise in this era will require something more. Um, you're all aware of the challenges that free enterprise faces, including the growing skepticism among many Americans about the benefits of capitalism. And uh, I would say the active consideration by many members of Congress of policies that would move key economic decisions into the public sector. Uh, according to one national survey that we did at the round table, about 27% of registered voters have a favorable view of socialism. Now that's obviously a lot less support than for capitalism, but still it's remarkable uh, given socialism's pretty dismal track record around the world. Um, but within BRT, we've had long discussions about the reasons for this discontent, right? The press normally attributes it to anger at inequality, then that's certainly part of the issue. But we think there are additional factors that are uh, worth including, like the decline in econo economic mobility in the United States, right? I mean, I, I think there's this idea that hard work won't be rewarded and that regardless of someone's efforts, uh, you know, they won't be able to get ahead. And the conclusion that we've reached within BRT is that despite overwhelming evidence that free enterprise and capitalism are the best systems for sustaining broad prosperity, many Americans have legitimate concerns about the way our economy is working for them. And they've concluded you know, that one way to help preserve the timeless benefits of capitalism is to demonstrate that the benefits of our economy are broadly shared. In addition, uh, we've concluded that our companies uh, each of which employs a lot of Americans and has influence in communities around the country, has a role to play in outlining the practices and policies that can help address some of the anxieties that are being felt by average Americans. So as a first step, uh, we took a look at our own business roundtable statement on the purpose of a corporation. And so here's some background on that. Since uh, 1978, BRT has put out a statement that outlines the purpose of a corporation. In the early years, the statements that we published addressed the importance of company investments and workers and communities and other stakeholders. But in 1997, our rhetoric shifted. BRT adopted language that really emphasized that the principal objective of a business enterprise was to generate economic returns for its owners. And so over the years, that language uh, had been used against CEO CEOs of BRT and really to say that big business and chief executives care only about shareholders. And um, we heard from critics that uh, the 1997 language uh, was the beginning of the end for capitalism, which struck us as an extreme overstatement, of course. Uh, but you know, in early 2019, we began interviewing uh, corporate governance experts on the implication of the language we had been using. Uh, most importantly, we began interviewing our own CEOs who consistently said, look, you know, of course we wanna generate value for shareholders but at the same time, we are also focused on being good employers and, and good members of our communities. And you know, some of us, so some of the CEOs told us that taking care of stakeholders, you know, was common sense. And, and frankly, the way that the best run companies had been operating for a long time. And so in the end, we concluded that the 1997 language didn't accurately reflect the ways that uh, our CEOs were trying to run their companies. And so after a number of months of discussions among our CEOs, we adopted new language that was endorsed by our membership, which says, first off, 
We believe the free market system is the best means of generating good jobs and a strong and sustainable economy, innovation, a healthy environment and economic opportunities for all. But second, uh, of course, companies should continue to try to generate returns for their shareholders, but they should do so while focusing on their customers and investing in their workers and the communities in which they operate. Now, uh, as many of you know, uh, since uh, its endorsement in, in 2019, the statement's been subject to, uh, I think, pretty vigorous debate. Uh, it's received tens of thousands of media mentions. The Wall Street Journal has uh, published multiple very critical op-eds. Uh, and we've welcomed this debate. I mean, there's plenty of room for principled opposition to the approach we've adopted. And uh, we fully recognize the difficulty of these issues. But I, I do want to respond to one particular criticism, and that's that you know some commentators have suggested that we're attempting to walk away from business obligations to shareholders or to diminish fiduciary duties, and we're not. Right? Boards have to make decisions that they believe in their reasonable business judgment or in the long-term interests of their shareholders. However, there's nothing in Delaware law or any state's law that says a CEO or you know that he or she should not also be a good employer or a good member of his or her community. And in our view, to succeed in 2021 and beyond, companies have to be able to do both. And so the CEOs have sort of rejected this idea that meeting the reasonable long-term expectations of multiple stakeholders is impossible. In fact, they've said um, at the time of enacting our statement that the long-term interests of a company's stakeholders, including shareholders, are inseparable. Um, a few years ago, Father Sirico, a founder of the Acton Institute, put it, I think, very well when he said, if you know anyone in business, you know that consumers must always be the first concern. The second concern is the workers who make production possible. A capitalist who serves himself the first fruits just isn't going to last very long in the market. Capitalist actions that are successful in the long run always are other directed. And look, we couldn't agree more because running your companies uh, in the interest of shareholders and your stakeholders isn't in conflict because shareholder value in the long term is lost if you don't strive to serve your customers, treat employees fairly, or if you're not uh, being a responsible member of your community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Uh, that was terrific. So our We'll now turn to our third panelist. That's uh, Dr. Samuel Gregg. Sam? Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's good to be with you, Amelia, and Will today, and everyone else, of course, who's watching this session. Well, I think until the 1950s, I think if people had asked, what's the purpose of business? I suspect the answer would have been more or less the same. But that hasn't been the case, as I think Amelia pointed out, for quite some time. And presently, much of the discussion oscillates in terms of Milton Friedman's article about what he thought co corporate social responsibility was, contra stakeholder theory. And I think in both cases, there's a lot of misquoting and misrepresentation of both positions. But I'd like to answer the question that we've been posed today, what is the purpose of business from another perspective? So I'd like to ask what type of organization a business is and what is it about business that allows it to make its distinct contribution to the overall flourishing of individuals and communities in a given society? In other words, a classic definition of what's called the common good. To answer that question, we need to identify a few criteria. The first I think is that businesses are voluntary associations. Second, like any voluntary association, the scope of their activity is determined but also restricted by the goal that's specific to business as a voluntary association. And the third thing I'd say is that businesses serve this wider common good by pursuing what happens to be their particular common good. When you think about it, I think any voluntary organization, whether it's a business, an NGO, or a charity, they all have a particular good that they're created to realize. In general, I think this means they shouldn't pursue goals beyond that particular end. Because I think things start to go wrong when voluntary associations start pursuing objectives that are more properly the responsibility 
of other groups. So we don't want businesses acting like chess clubs or political parties or vice versa for that matter. So to avoid these problems, I think we need to identify what is the specific good that's served by business. And I think the deceased natural law philosopher, Germain Grise, he offers a very good definition. He says this, he says, the common end of every voluntary association is determined by its participants' mutual understanding and consent. He then says, a profit-making business is a voluntary association of the persons who cooperate in the specific activities for which it was organized in order to realize various economic benefits, end quote. So these economic benefits from this standpoint are the good that's primarily realized through a business association. So what does a private business association do? Well, it brings together investors, owners, managers, and non-managerial employees, and they freely cooperate together to organize monetary capital, technology, skills, labor, and entrepreneurial insight to realize certain economic goals. Now, the reasons why individuals associate themselves with a particular business, they vary. Some people want to learn more about the particular business, that they're involved in the particular sector. Others simply see the same, very same business as a means for them to derive an income. But whatever people's reasons for freely involving themselves in a company, I think everyone has to be committed to realizing the specific economic benefits that the business exists to realize, because that's the good that binds all these people together. Now, this understanding of business, it's not a license for any participant in the company to treat others solely as a means to economic ends. But this understanding of business also grounds and limits the authority of those in the enterprise who have the responsibility for coordinating all the activities that allow a business to realize its specific end. So it's on this basis, for instance, that CEOs may terminate employees. If a manager is consistently failing to perform up to the required standards, it compromises the company's ability to realize its goals. So while there's room for the discussion about how you let an employee go, the CEO's authority to terminate that manager comes from the CEO's responsibility to ensure that the company achieves its specific goods. I also think that the same good also puts some, some restrictions around CEOs and boards from involving business in the pursuit of agendas that are agendas that have little to nothing to do with the firm's primary goals. Now, there are, of course, many charitable, cultural, political activities that people involved in a business can and sometimes should be involved in. But I think if such endeavors have no immediate bearing on the company's ability to realize its particular common good, and sometimes that bearing can be very wide and sometimes it can be narrower, but if these endeavors don't have that type of immediate bearing, I think these individuals should do so in a private capacity in other voluntary associations and certainly not with company resources. Now, some might ask, don't private companies have responsibilities that go beyond these boundaries? Isn't it the case that businesses have, for example, duties to their customers? And in recent decades, uh, particularly since the 1980s, many have argued that businesses have obligations to literally anyone or anything affected by their activities. Now, depending on which theorist you read, and there are many, stakeholders can range from relatively easily identifiable individuals and groups to whom there clearly is an obligation, for example, like your clients or your local environment. But there are also some who argue that stakeholders embrace catch-all universals, such as those identified recently by the head of the World Economic Forum. And he said it's all about four Ps, prosperity, people, planet, peace. That's pretty broad criteria. Now, I happen to think that anyone in a business should follow all the moral principles that bind everyone else. So that, among other things, means you don't kill, you don't steal, and you don't lie to customers or anyone else. 
I think it's also very clear that businesses must obey all the just laws, all the just regulations that legislators deem necessary for society's common good. And I think that the principal ways in which businesses fulfill their duties to all those entities that might qualify as stakeholders. The last thing I'll say is this. There's a very specific way in which business contributes to this broad common good. And I think that's by pursuing the specific good that businesses are designed to realize. Now, a society's common good consists of all those conditions that assist all members of the society to flourish as they should. And different organizations have primary responsibility for these various conditions. The military, for instance, they promote national security. The judiciary administers justice. And I think the condition that's specific to each entity reflects its particular competence. Judges don't fight wars and generals don't administer justice for civilians. So I think from this standpoint, one primary condition of society's common good realized by business is of course the creation of the wealth that provides for people's material needs and wants. Now governments can assist businesses accomplish this through, for example, providing public works, protecting property rights, maintaining courts, devising just regulations, et cetera. But I think we need to keep in mind that the organization that most often creates wealth in societies that take human freedom and justice seriously is private business. Now, to be sure, this goal, this end, isn't always at the forefront of the minds of people in business. For some entrepreneurs, it's all about the satisfaction they get from deriving or creating a new product or service. Others work in the private sector because they're willing to trade off less employment security in return for higher salaries. But a side effect of all these free choices, I think, is that they allow businesses to drive the type of economic growth that over time raises living standards and provides for society's material needs. And that's, I think, the primary way in which business contributes to a society's common good. And that's how I think the purpose of business serves society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam, and thank you to the uh, to our other panelists. So this was a terrific way to begin our discussion. Um, so maybe now we can turn to um, a little bit of question and answer. So I have questions that I'd like to ask, and um, in the interest of making this interesting for all the people who are watching, or maybe even more interesting, I'll be a little provocative. Um, so I'll ask questions, uh, first one for uh, Amelia, and then Will, and then Sam. But uh, So I'll turn to you, Amelia. So you've argued for encouraging companies to account for, as you put it, stakeholder, uh, not just stakeholders, but even a little bit more specifically, things like the environment, taking the environment into consideration, various other um, social ends. Um, and I think that's in part because uh, you, as you mentioned, firms often have externalities. So they're not just entirely self-contained organizations or entities. They have externalities, meaning there are effects of their activities on uninvolved or un, um, uh, 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 on third parties that we don't uh, consult. Um, so let me build a little bit on a part of what Sam um, argued and ask you this question. Um, how should we balance these, uh, these rather broad objectives? So for whatever, um, whatever its faults, Profit seems a relatively straightforward uh, measuring stick, both for evaluating companies um, and corporate executives. Um, and it's also, in a way, um, a fairly straightforward measure for ensuring accountability to the shareholders who, after all, have put their resources at risk in a company. Um, so if profit is an incomplete way, at least it seems it's fairly precise. But these other objectives um, seem somewhat less precise. Um, and a, a critic might even say they're vague and maybe even without, they're open-ended and it's not clear how to evaluate on the basis of these other objectives. So if we want to, in good faith, incorporate them and try to balance them somehow, how do we actually measure these things? Thank you so much, James. And and uh, thanks for this opportunity. It's been a already fascinating and thought-provoking discussion. Um, Sam's, I agree with much of what Sam said, and um, I agree with you, James, that the standards are, uh, you know, currently uh, in a nascent stage. But I'd like to, to highlight one thing that's running throughout this debate that, that actually runs throughout the corporate governance debate 
often, which is a false distinction between economic and non-economic ends. These things, climate change, racial injustice, income inequality, are economic factors because they are systematic risks that threaten the entire market. Large asset managers understand this. This is a fundamental, fundamentally economic calculation for them. Insurance companies understand this. They're building this analysis into their underwriting process. The metrics are getting better. The four largest accounting firms have uh, banded together to work with the standard setters to develop um, more specificity around how to measure total cost of externalities for um, you know, a, a pollution, for example or for a particular product, the impact that that's having on the workforce. I think that we can do better than saying we should use profit or stock price because it's easy to measure. I think that we have a lot of sophistication in economics um, today, that in environmental economics in particular, um, that we can marshal towards uh, you know, an economic accounting of the true cost of externalities. Um, but I, I do want to um, emphasize that this distinction between economic things over here that business should deal with and all of this social stuff or environmental stuff that's better placed in um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the responsibility of NGOs or, or government is a false distinction. And the large um, asset managers, again, understand that. The important thing uh, for business to do, I agree, is to enhance the common good, the commonwealth. But what is the commonwealth? The commonwealth means one business cannot externalize its costs on to society or onto another business because the entire portfolio suffers. And hence, the commonwealth suffers, the national economy suffers, and where we are, we end up where we are today. Thank you, Amelia. So, uh, Will, Amelia argues that there's a false distinction between economic and non-economic ends, um, or let it, this is set up in a way to uh, create a kind of false dilemma. Um, based on the, uh, your argument, it seemed to me that you were suggesting that part of your argument was that um, for businesses, what you're hearing from your member businesses and from CEOs and other executives is that there is something important um, some important social ends that they're responding to. So in an important way, you see um, the recommendation to consider certain things other than just profit to be really part of what the a business, uh, a for-profit business should do in a market economy. So correct me if I'm misrepresenting your argument. Um, but let me ask you this. Um, it sounds as if part of the argument is, well, businesses are really responding to changes in culture and to changes in demands from consumers, citizens, other stakeholders. Um, and they're doing so in such a way that if they respond to them properly, um, this might actually be in their own long-term best interest as for-profit companies. Um, so if that's true, then is this really a moral concern that they're responding to, or is this really just um, you know, good business? So if it turned out that ultimately it would lead to long-term benefit if they improve the lighting in their uh, warehouses, or if they got new computers, or if they got uniforms for their employees. These aren't particularly moral or non-moral concerns. They're just good business practice. Um, and if it's just good business practice, is it, does it really have a moral content, or does there have to be some kind of sacrifice that businesses are willing to take in the service of their moral ends for it to count as properly moral? Sure. Uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I guess I would start by saying that at least the statement that Business Roundtable put forward in 2019, it's, uh, it's not a repudiation of shareholder interests in, in favor of political or social goals, right? The statement reflects the fact that for companies to be successful and durable and return value to shareholders, they have to consider the interests and meet the fair expectations of a, of a range of stakeholders in addition to shareholders, right? Um, but I will say, you know, we know Americans, uh, many Americans are struggling, you know, work is, off, is, you know, is, is often not rewarded uh, and not enough is, is being done for workers to adjust to the rapid pace of change in the economy. 
Um, and, you know, if, if companies fail to recognize, you know, that the success of our system uh, is dependent on long-term growth, then a lot of people in our country are going to have legitimate questions about the role of large employers in our society. Um, and so I would say that the, the statements made by our association uh, have, uh, particularly around the purpose statement, they've been to really reinforce our commitment to, you know, a, a free market economy that, that serves all, all Americans. Now, when it comes to statements made by individual companies, you know, I would say that, you know, our, many of our companies touch aspects of our everyday life, right? BRT companies employ 15 million people, uh, and they are deeply embedded into different aspects of our society. Uh, and some uh, issues when companies are silent, some of their employees and customers may equate that to them being complicit in the various various issues. And look, I, I'll just say that individual companies have their own individual purpose. Um, we have set out a statement that our companies have committed to in terms of what is good business practice in terms of how to operate your, com your, your company for kind of for the long term. Um, but in regards to particular issues, when companies weigh in, it should be authentic and it should not be about branding and it should be in relation to the stakeholders of, of that individual company. Okay, thank you. So Sam, um, a couple of questions to you, I think um, that were basically directed by Amelia and Will, but uh, one from Amelia, uh, isn't it the case that, um, that firms are joint enterprises they, um, they have activities that have effects beyond their own walls, including social, political, environmental effects. And if so, shouldn't they be held accountable for all of those effects, not just um, for returning value to shareholders? Um, and you know, just thinking about what Will said now, um, isn't it, wouldn't it be the case that in the long-term, if, if a for-profit company is interested in its long-term profit, its long-term survivability, um, then it should take these social considerations um, into effect. It should it should really think about these effects that it has on uh, things outside its walls. Thanks for that. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on uh, both your questions. Well, it is obviously the case that companies have externalities. They vary from social to community to environment. Uh, when a company, for example, gets up and moves from one location to another, that obviously has implications for the surrounding community. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's not a point in dispute. Uh, to the extent, I think, that, for example, some forms of stakeholder theory say, well, businesses should treat their employees and customers fairly, they should honour contracts, they should obey just laws, they should respect the environment, etc., well, in many respects, that is how they are fulfilling those types of responsibilities. And they have an obligation to be involved in shaping what that looks like, both at the level of regulation and at the level of law. Of course, the, the thing that you have to watch for is the sheer breadth of some of the claims that are being made that businesses are supposed to be responding to. So it's one thing to say, okay, uh, such and such a firm needs to be very conscious of what's going on in its community, many of its customers are there, many of its clients are there, et cetera. It's very different to say, you are now responsible for world peace. Uh, if you read, for example, um, the book recently published by Klaus Schwab uh, on stakeholder capitalism, well, he says there, profit is one thing. The three other P's though, peace, um, the planet, and the third and fourth one is uh, escaping me. But um, I, think, planet, I think it's people, isn't people, it? People, right. Well, okay, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean, some sort of eternal county in peace that they're supposed to be contributing to? And if so, how? Uh, as for the planet, well, are they responsible for what's going on on the other side of the world? Or there's, is their primary responsibility what's going on immediately around them? So, I think a lot depends on which type of stakeholder theory you're, you're looking at. Some of them, I think, are simply articulating uh, responsibilities that I think that any conscious corporate citizen is going to follow. Others, I think, and not in some cases, not all, have a much more explicitly political agenda attached to them. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing in terms of 
long-term, long-term sustainability? Well, there's a couple of things that can be said about that. In the first place, obviously companies that want to be around in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time have to think about how they sustain themselves and they have to think about changing directions within their customer base. They have to think about what's going on in their society. A, a company, for example, that tried to, in, that was loca located in, say, for example, Alabama, that tried to maintain the type of uh, arrangement that prevailed before the Civil Rights Act probably wouldn't be around today, right? <laughs> That's an example. Um, but at the same time, uh, one has to say to yourself, okay, well, what does this mean? What does this, how does it actually cash out? Because long-term can shift very, very quickly. So, for example, we see a lot of companies are, um, are responding to the idea that people want their social political preferences reflected in their consumer choices. Okay, well, if you're a, a business that's pursuing profit, it probably makes sense to be paying attention to that. But that can change as well. People get older, they read some economics, they get married. Sometimes their views change about all sorts of things. And suddenly if a business is not careful, it can find itself pursuing the objectives of a generation that grew up in the 1970s or 1960s. So <clears throat> um, certainly, yes, long-term sustainability is crucial if a business is going to survive. But I would urge businesses to pay a lot of attention to going to what's actually going on and what's likely to be going on in the near to the near future, because I think the assumptions that may be prevalent at one particular point can become redundant very, very quickly. Thank you, Sam. So um, I'm going to build on part of what you said. I think part of your argument for Amelia and Will. Um, so suppose companies and corporate executives. Um, are persuaded by the argument um, that they should broaden their focus. Um, I think this might be part of what Sam was getting at, uh, but my qu the question would be, why should we trust them that they'll get it right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of suspicion of uh, business people and CEOs already. Um, does a call for them to look at much broader focus, including things like um, prosperity, people, planet, peace, does that put too much faith in them that they'll get it right? Why should we think not, I mean, maybe they would get it right if they were all philosopher kings and queens, but um, most business leaders, I don't mean any offense, aren't philosopher kings and queens. So why should we think that they should get it, they would get it right? And why would we put that much faith in, uh, in them in the attempt? That can be for either Amelia or Will. I can, I can take that. So um, I'm actually writing a paper on this. Uh, ah. And uh, it's called a test for stakeholder governance with uh, my co-author, Professor Stavros Gadinas. Um, again, we look at an institutional approach. We examined how does stakeholder governance work in practice? Because there's a lot of suspicion triggered by Larry Fink's letter and the business roundtable letter that this is just, you know, a cover, a sham for CEO aggrandizement or um, pet projects that CEOs may be passionate about or as a way to cover up um, poor performance, essentially. When you observe stakeholder governance in practice, what you realize it is, is that it is far more accountable. It makes managers and directors far more accountable to both the board, and it makes boards far more accountable to shareholders than the shareholder primacy model. The shareholder primacy model looks at one metric, stock price, which hundreds of papers have, have demonstrated can be very easily manipulated. And you know, we all know that here. What's much harder to, uh, to manipulate are literally hundreds of metrics that are being churned through a corporate um, uh, stakeholder oversight and ESG um, infrastructure that is getting constant feedback from stakeholders, from shareholders, from regulators, from people with very different interests. It's a messy process, but it's a process that builds upon what corporate law has tried to do, uh, which is provide better and better information to the board and management in order to make the board more accountable to shareholders. That is why, again, shareholders are pushing for this. They're not pushing for it because Larry Fink is a socialist. They're pushing for it because they realize that 
the ESG process and stakeholder governance is so incredibly robust and superior at overseeing not only financial risk, but emerging financial risk um, in a way that is uh, really far better than, than uh, shareholder primacy and a singular focus on profit. And ESG is environmental, social, and governance. Did I get that right, Amelia? Yes, environmental, social, and governance. It also happens to be, uh, perhaps subconsciously, the, the initials of my youngest daughter. Aha, that's why you support it. No, I'm kidding. Um, Will, was there something you wanted to say about that question as well? Yeah, I, I, you know, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I would agree that the board should be cognizant of developments related to economic, social, and environmental issues and, and should understand which issues are more important to uh, or most important to the company's business and to its shareholders. And, and this is a concept that BRT has endorsed. Um, you can find it in our principles of corporate governance. I mean, it's just good business practice. I would say, though, that, you know, in regards to the fiduciary duty of corporate directors, you know, boards don't operate in a vacuum, right? I mean, that they need to make decisions on an informed basis and in good faith and in the honest belief that the actions that they take are in the best interest of the company and its stockholders. And so you could add to that, you know, the board needs to factor in all ESG risk. Uh, but, you know, let's think about that. You know, if you you, should you also add in compliance risks? Should you, should, should you add in secession risks? Should those be added in? I mean, I, I guess I would just say that, you know, legislatures have avoided that. They've opted for a flexible context, context specific approach. If there's material ESG risk, you're, I think you're absolutely right. A board better be paying attention because if they're not, uh, you know, you can have an argument that a board isn't informed and it's not acting in good faith under its current fiduciary obligations. But you know, expanding the current fiduciary duty isn't isn't necessary. It's not something Business Roundtable has has argued for, and it's it's probably a very slippery slope. Yeah, and just to clarify, I'm not arguing for an expansion of the duty or for um, any regulatory reform. Uh, what I'm what I'm emphasizing is that. Uh, the ESG and stakeholder governance process, when you observe it in practice, allows boards to oversee their fiduciary duty to, uh, you know, uh, uh, prevent uh, financial and legal risk in a much more uh, robust way. Thank you. Well, I, ha I feel like I have to bring up a, uh, a currently relevant issue, a current topical issue, and Sam, I'll give you the first crack at this question, but it's for all of you. So lead, some of the leading technological and social media companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google have recently begun to use moral and political commitments to influence their activities. But that's been quite controversial, as I'm sure you all know. It's led to a lot of criticism and in some cases, some uh, division. So should company, other kinds of companies follow their lead in allowing their moral or political principles to influence their activities? Uh, perhaps in the process, risking alienating some of their users or consumers? Or should they strive to remain neutral with respect to these competing moral or political perspectives? Um, and is this, um, is what Facebook, Twitter, and Google, what they've been doing, is this an extension of um, a, an example of the right kind of ESG or otherwise broadening of the purpose of, a, of what companies should be paying attention to? Thanks for that nice, easy question, Jim. Okay, well, a couple of thoughts. Um, when we get to that, that scale of issue, I have noticed a fair amount of selectivity on the part of some very big corporations. So for example, Apple, let's take Apple. So um, the head of Apple has said that he wants to spend $100 million on uh, dealing with issues of racial injustice, et cetera, in the United States. And yet he has said nothing about what's going on in China with Uyghur Muslims, with um, any number of abuses that are being committed by, uh, in some cases, racial abuses being, uh, being uh, committed by what is, after all, a communist authoritarian regime. So there's a fair amount of selectivity that's going on here, which uh, that's problematic because if you're going to be uh, presenting yourself as uh, articulating a particular moral message. And I think the business people are just as entitled to do that as anyone else. And they should be darn consistent in the way that they talk about these types 
of issues because they leave themselves open to the uh, obviously inconsistency, but also the uh, the charge that um, well, in the end, economic self interest is over will override what you are parading as being your moral concern for a particular problem. So as we all know, Apple have lots and lots of operations in mainland China now. So I suspect uh, they're probably not going to be saying very much about what's going on in China because we know what the communist regime will do to companies and does do to companies that don't tow the line. So Apple's an example of a company, I think, that is being grossly inconsistent in the way that it presents itself and talks about these sorts of issues. Is this, uh, the second question, is this a sort of um, extension of the shareholder uh, thing? Well, it depends which shareholder theory you're talking about, because there's lots and lots of different shareholder theories out there, some of which uh, you could argue um, give rise to this type of language and rhetoric and behavior on the part of some CEOs. But there's plenty of stakeholder theories that would say, no, actually, this is probably not what businesses should be doing. And this is actually a distraction from uh, some of the good points and good insights that some stakeholder theorists bring to the question of what is the proper responsibility of a corporation or a business in a given community. Thank you, Amelia or Will, do you have a thought about that? I do, but I'll, I'll see the floor to Will and then I'll go last. Okay. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, I, I guess I would say just responding to a couple of, of the points I made. I mean, I, business roundtable and our companies support free and fair commerce with foreign nations that benefit American workers and businesses. We believe strongly in the freedom of expression. We oppose efforts to use economic pressure to stifle that freedom. Um, you know, I, this, these are the really complicated issues. In terms of kind of racial inequality, um, you know, I'd say that we've seen real incidences of police brutality. There's real angst in our society regarding racial inequality. Some of our companies recognize these issues are important to their employees. They're important to their customers. Um, and to the extent companies want to lead on those issues, um, you know, they should do so, and, but they should do so in, a, in an authentic way. Um, that's obviously not just, not just branding, but uh, an authentic way that I think kind of responds to, to the concerns that are important to their individual stakeholders. Amelia? Yeah, uh, thank you, James. So, so your, your question is a really interesting one and one that I thought a lot about and one that you can imagine that the students, um, you know, find it thrilling uh, to, to study brand activism. Um, now, brand activism is um, often related to the shareholder stakeholder debate, but I'll take the, uh, but not always. With respect to racial justice, it absolutely is. Now, as, as Sam pointed out, the, these issues morph and change. And again, that's why it's very important for corporate directors and managers to be eliciting information from a wide, as wide as possible uh, of an array of stakeholders uh, so that they can respond to the issues of the day. Um, now, uh, racial injustice is absolutely an economic issue. I mean, it's perfectly aligned with uh, shareholder primacy and long-term or even short-term sustainability of companies. Um, we can see that reflected in things like the stock exchange requiring now uh, board diversity uh, and in regulation being passed um, all over the country mandating gender and racial diversity on board. Again, these are not social issues. Uh, these are fundamentally economic issues um, because the validity and the social license to operate for the company depends on um, uh, depends increasingly on these issues. So to the extent that there's uh, alignment, it, it, it makes sense. Um, Sam raises a good point with respect to inconsistencies. There will be inconsistencies because there's limited time, there's limited resources and corporate directors and managers have to be strategic about which decisions um, you know, align with their interests and, and which don't. Uh, but again, if you look at these as business issues and not put them in the bucket of moral issues, uh, then that inconsistency can be reconciled. 
I think that leads to um, um, another interesting question. So we only have a few minutes left and I'll uh, raise a general question uh, to all of you. And maybe uh, first Amelia, um, since you uh, raised the issue about a business issue versus a moral issue. Um, when we talk about the social responsibility of business, um, we don't often talk, or if we talk about say corporate social responsibility, um, is this a responsibility that is unique to business or is this a generalizable responsibility? So, I mean, we, we don't talk about law firm. We don't hear people talking about law firm social responsibility or university social responsibility or even consumer social responsibility. Um, we talk about corporate or social responsibility. So is there something unique um, about businesses that incurs some kind of moral obligation or moral responsibility that's different from other moral responsibility? Um, or is this in fact just generalizable? It's just their particular version of something that all of us should do or all organizations should face. Yeah, I mean, I think all organizations have uh, moral obligations, but I think that the reason businesses are different is because businesses have an obligation to their shareholders to increase value. The way that they do that is by accounting for impacts on stakeholders. Again, I don't, I don't draw this distinction of businesses should act morally, uh, rather um, externalizing negative externalities, even if the law perfectly allows for it, uh, is increasingly untenable uh, because of the interconnected nature of our markets. Thank you, Amelia. Will? Sure. I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, our view is that companies should be contributing positively to society, but they do that, right, by focusing on their stakeholders, by focusing on their customers, by treating their employees well, and by being responsible members of their communities. And, you know, because shareholder value in the long term is lost if you're not focusing on the very things that make your company great, right? You shouldn't be, as, uh, as Father Sirico put it, you know, serving yourself the first fruit. So the point is, there's a role for corporations in helping address some of the anxieties around capitalism. Some of our companies have done an excellent job in this area. Uh, but even among those members, there's a desire to do more. And so our members made a commitment to act in a responsible manner when it comes to serving their individual stakeholders. And, and look, we think the statement that we put out is an important step in the right direction, but it's just a step. It's, it's part of a much longer story about you know, how companies have been working to support their workers and, and communities. And there's still a lot, um, a lot of work to be done. We've got a lot of examples of kind of company investments that they're making, particularly in their workforce and their and their training. And, and these are things that I think average Americans should care about because um, particularly in, in an economy that is ever evolving with technological advances, it's important that companies care about their workers and care about their communities and make those investments. And then finally, you know, I'd, I'd also say that companies are one piece of this puzzle, puzzle right? I mean, I, I think that the government plays an important role as well, um, just as the private sector serves to grow and innovate and create jobs and invest in the stakeholders that uh, continue to make uh, growth and job creation possible. The government has a role in, in areas like workforce training and investing in infrastructure and supporting basic research. And so we also you know, have pressed Congress to achieve these goals through a number of, of policy changes that, that we think kind of are to the betterment of of society and, and our stakeholders as well. Thank you, Will. Uh, Sam, you have the last word for our last minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's lots to say. One is, I, I mean, to your general question, I think one reason why there's so much focus, there's two reasons why I think there's so much focus upon social responsibility of business and many of the things that Amelia, Will, and I have been talking about. One, of course, is that business is so central to the lives that so many people lead. It's where large numbers of people between the ages of, let's say, 25 and 70, it's where a lot of people spend lots and lots of their time. And that being the case, there's an immense focus upon making sure that this very big part of life in America and life and around the world, which has enormous impacts, both seen and unseen upon countless people, 
it doesn't surprise me in that sense that there's such a focus upon, say, the social responsibility of business in the way that we don't talk about, I think you mentioned law firms, Jim, and that will be trade unions. We don't hear, really hear people talking about the social responsibility of trade unions, for example. But I think it's got something to do with the centrality of business to contemporary market economies and modern societies. The second, of course, I think is that let's remember that there's a long hostility long tradition of hostility towards business that goes right back to the 19th century and even before that. And it's not just coming from obvious people like Marx, it's coming from a range of different groups from all sectors of the, uh, all across the political spectrum, by the way. It's not just a left-wing thing, you'll find plenty of right-wing people who are very hostile to business. Uh, and some of these concerns might be valid. I mean, I think, for example, um, many people today are very exercised about the problem of cronyism and crony capitalism. Uh, I often say to people, I'm, not, I'm less in favor of business, I'm much more in favor of free markets because markets are very, very effective ways of dealing with this problem of cronyism and cronyism is a real problem. So there are these, these anxieties, some of which I think are uh, much more ideological in nature, but others which actually have some foundation. And it's also the case that business is a realm in which self-interest operates, obviously, in a way that's not always as immediately apparent in other some, some other fields of life. And self-interest is one of these things that we have to watch and be very careful about because it can become very destructive if we're not careful. So I, I don't think it's a surprise that we have all these different um, causes of why business gets so much attention when it comes to these things. Uh, some of which have to do with the sheer prominence of business and the role, the critical role that it plays in our society. But also there's these long traditions of criticism of business, some of which I think are not so valid, some of which do have some teeth, which I think um, naturally means that people pay a lot more attention to what's going on in the business world than they do to other, some other sectors of society. Thank you very much, Sam. So I think all of the panelists and I would agree that um, all human beings have dignity and should be respected accordingly. And understanding what role business should play in respecting their dignity and also contributing to human flourishing and prosperity in the best way that it can. These will remain um, important questions that we need to continue discussing. My thanks to the panelists. Thank you, Amelia Miazad, Will Anderson, Sam Gregg. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to the next time we can continue the conversation.